exercise performance, carbohydrate metabolism, and carbohydrate dosing. So welcome, Dr. Smith. So great to have you here. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Let's see. I'm trying to see if my, my screen seems to be sharing. So, Tricia? Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you. So thank you for having me at this. Um, I feel like I'm kind of coming in is the guy talking about the stuff that a lot of people don't like looking at carbohydrate and sugar. But as I went through it, I think I'll take you through my path that I've experienced and I've worked through it and how I've kind of got to the position that I am now. So as we start out, I think that we look at what are our sources of energy during exercise. We have fats, we have carbohydrates, we have proteins. And as we look at energy sources during different activities, we see carbohydrates take us through the anaerob anaerobic pathways, meaning that they're gonna provide ATP quickly for us for exercise intensities that have high intensities. As we break down fats as our fuel sources, this is gonna be a more time consuming process. It's gonna be aerobic in nature. So moving over to proteins, I'm gonna to touch on proteins really briefly. And I think Dr. Antonio did a really good job today showing all the benefits of protein. But usually when we look at fuel during exercise, we leave protein out. And while in some ways this is unfair because protein is playing a role there, the role that we see coming from protein is a minor one compared to what we see from fats and carbohydrates during the exercise period. When we talk about carbohydrates, we normally see that, or we don't have these simple carbohydrates being glucose, fructose, or common ones, and galactose. Glucose is the one that we're gonna see mainly in the body as we look at blood glucose levels, we look at the way the brain's using fuel, is nearly always in the glucose form of the carbohydrate. And as we look at glycogen, which is gonna be the way the body's storing our carbohydrate in large forms, we see that glycogen is made up of an entire chain of glucose units. And this molecule can become a quite big molecule with a lot of glucose units in it. One of the really big benefits that we have of glycogen is that as we look at the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, we see this maze of little glucose units. But everywhere that there's a glucose unit on an end of a line, that one we can pull off and utilize as fuel in the muscle. And so when we're exercising, glycogen provides us a lot of energy as it's able to pull glucose off every endpoint of that glycogen molecule. So for simplicity, I'm gonna use this little cartoon as a glycogen. You see it's much simpler than the image that I showed previously of the large glycogen molecule. But when we look at these fuels, there's my glycogen molecule. Um, and we have different carbohydrates that we're able to ingest. And when we look at our glucose, our fructose, and our galactose, we're able to ingest those, and those are in the simple form. As these simple carbohydrates combine, we can add a glucose and a fructose together to get our sucrose, which is a common sugar. Oftentimes we see that as our table sugar. We can have our glucose and our galactose combined for lactose, where we get a lot of our dairy sugars. Two glucoses combined for maltose, and we have maltodextrin and amylopectin, and we consider these fast carbohydrates. So as these are into our body, we're able to free up the glucose units rather quickly. We're able to convert that fructose over in this sucrose molecule quickly to be able to utilize as a fuel. On the right hand of this screen, we see some of the slower carbohydrates. Fructose and galactose are gonna fall over here as being slow use carbohydrates. Isomotulose, isomotulose is very similar to sucrose, meaning that it's a glucose and a fructose disaccharide combination. But the, the linkage between that glucose and fructose is different, making this a much more difficult molecule to break into its simple sugar forms. Similar to maltose, we have trehalose, but like isomotrolose, trehalose has changed the bond between these two glucoses, making it a harder molecule to break down. And in the bottom, we have amylose. 
Now, as we look at our amylose and our maltodextrin, these are very similar molecules, except our amyloses are going to be much longer molecules. As we talked about with the glycogen, the benefit of glycogen was that we had a lot of glucose units on end lines of that molecule that we were able to pull off to use as fuel sources. When we look at amylose, amylose, we have this really long chain and we still only have these two endpoints that we can pull carbohydrate from. So we can have a lot of maltodextrins bringing a number of glucose units or a single amylose bringing the same number of glucose units. And those maltodextrins will actually allow us to get those glucose units free faster because there are more individual maltodextrins as compared to the long amylose. So when we're looking at fuels and we're looking at trying to get energy fast into the body, the ones on the right, on the left-hand side, looking at fat ability to be used, we can use these at about a gram per minute as they're being ingested. If we look over on the right-hand side, the slow ones, we're only able to use at about half that rate. So if we're trying to get energy in quick, we want to look at the ones on the left-hand side as opposed to the ones on the right-hand side. If at any time we combine these, so if we look at a lot of sports drinks and a lot of sports products, oftentimes these are a combination of a glucose unit with a fructose unit or glucose and sucrose to get again that combination of glucose units and fructose units. And our utilization of carbohydrate can move up to about 90 grams of ingested carbohydrate per hour. So this is gonna be important as we think about the carbohydrates that we ingest. And the reason that we look at ingesting carbohydrate during exercise is we're trying to maintain muscle glycogen levels. Research has been consistently finding, and for, for quite some time it's become accepted, that muscle glycogen is one of the big determinants on fatigue during exercise. If we look at the beginning muscle glycogen concentrations, from a low carbohydrate diet compared to a normal Western diet and a high carbohydrate diet, we see that muscle glycogen levels are beginning at the beginning of exercise are lower in the low carbohydrate diet. Now, what that means is that once we get to exercise, if we assess it as time to exhaustion, the people that are on the low carbohydrate diets are going to fatigue sooner than those that are on the high carbohydrate diet. And the other thing that we see in this model is when we have a high and low carbohydrate diet with severe training, that we see a depletion in muscle glycogen with exercise. A high carbohydrate diet returns muscle glycogen levels to a similar level to the, what they were at the beginning of the exercise in the previous day, while the low carbohydrate diet doesn't really increase much muscle glycogen between sessions 24 hours apart. Now, when we look at exercise being day after day, we see that we're going to deplete glycogen, increase it, deplete it, increase it, deplete it, increase it with a high carbohydrate diet. Opposite to that, when we have a low carbohydrate diet, we deplete it, it remains basically the same. We deplete it further, it remains basically the same. We continue to deplete it further, and it remains basically the same. So if we're having a low carbohydrate diet, and we think of the slide that I showed previously that beginning in this low state, you've actually decreased your time to exhaustion, then having a high carbohydrate diet is gonna be beneficial for your next day's training sessions. Now, one of the drawbacks when we hear all of the research about carbohydrate during exercise is nearly every study is looking at endurance sports. So in this example that I'm showing in this graph, they were doing a constant cycling exercise. When we looked at the time to exha exhaustion on the previous slide, again, those are carbohydrate and seeing how long can you go in an endurance exercise, either running or cycling. Now, one of the things that I've always had an interest in is looking at how does the carbohydrate role play into the sports that are more traditionally done. If we look at resistance training, we look at ball sports, that that same constant intensity for prolonged periods of time effort, but have either bursts of energy with times of rest in between, such as American football, where a play is about five and a half seconds long with about 25 to 30 seconds between plays. That's a much different physiological beast of 
required of the athlete as opposed to just having that constant duration at a lower intensity for the prolonged period of time. So in this study by Dr. Hoff, we see that they actually had athletes come in, they had them during exercise consume carbohydrate or not consume carbohydrate. They were given a little bit of carbohydrate before they started and they tested a baseline sample. They then performed isokinetic exercise, meaning they were moving at velocities against the resistance. And we see some depletion in our muscle glycogen levels. But with the isokinetic exercise, we didn't get significant differences isokinetic to post-isokinetic, as it's seen by the pre-lift bars. Now, after they finished their isokinetic exercise, they then went into a regular strength and conditioning training session. In this session, they did repeated isotonic exercise against the same resistance. And we see that post-exercise, the muscle glycogen levels were depleted in those that had placebo as opposed to those having carbohydrate, suggesting that if we can consume carbohydrate during resistance training, we may be better able to maintain muscle glycogen levels and prolong our ability to perform. So when we look at, we have the endurance athletes we talked about earlier, we have the power athletes that we talk about, and I, I use these two as examples, and this is what people usually go to and think about are these track and field based athletes. We think of a marathon runner like Kipchoge doing his two hour marathon is being, that's endurance. We think of Usain Bolt doing his 100 meter sprint as power and explosion. But this continuum doesn't stop here. If we look at endurance, this is an image from Badwater, which is a 135 mile race, which is about six times longer than what Kipchoge ran. We look at power and we look at strength and conditioning athletes that have one lift, have two lifts. And I think a lot of times these are left out as we're looking at the energy needs of athletes. So when we think of these energy needs, let's not like leave ourselves caught within track and field, but look at the ultra endurance guys that are probably a better representation of efficiency with different fuel needs from Kipchoge. And we look at our strength and conditioning power athletes being weightlifters, bodybuilders, powerlifters, as having a different type of energy needs than Usain Bolt in the 100 meter sprint. This intensity they're working at becomes quite important as we look at the fuels that are being utilized. When we look at exercise intensities that are about 25% of VO2 max, these are gonna be heavily reliant on muscle triglycerides and muscle free fatty acid with a small role of plasma glucose. As exercise moves up to about 65%, muscle glycogen starts coming into play. We still relying heavily on muscle triglycerides, plasma free fatty acids, and plasma glucose levels come up a little bit compared to what we had at 25%. When most people think of marathoners, marathoners are usually running at an intensity somewhere between 65 and 75% of their VO2 max. So the, curve, the bar we're seeing above the 65 here is a fair representation of the fuel needs of a marathon athlete. When we look at athletes that are going to 85% of VO2 max, we're getting a much heavier reliance on muscle glycogen and plasma glucose is the fuel source and a reduction in free fatty acid utilization for sport. Now, as this happens, this is gonna play an important role on what the nutrient needs are for the athletes because of the, in the metabolic pathway they're using in sport. One of my favorite graphs comes from a paper from 1974. And everybody talks about when you're running a marathon, you hit a wall at two hours, or you hit a wall at 90 minutes, somewhere in this time frame. And that wall that we hit is due to the reduction in muscle glycogen associated with the fuel utilization. And if we remember, that intensity is somewhere around 65 to 75% of VO2 max. Now, if we look at muscle glycogen use and the depletion of muscle glycogen over time, if we're at an exercise intensity of 31%, we're out nearly three hours and we've depleted it by about half. If we're looking at an intensity of about 65%, we end up depleting most of our muscle glycogen by about 
90 minutes to that two hour mark that we see in a marathon. So this is where most people think of and this gray line is a representation of how most people see the depletion of carbohydrate. So a lot of times in sports, you hear the comments that, hey, you're not exercising for this long a period of time. There's not a need for carbohydrates. And this message, this message is kind of carried out throughout all sport. I remember being as an athletic trainer, being like, hey, this is tennis or this is football. This isn't marathon. They don't need carbohydrate. The thing people are missing is actually shown in this graph though. As exercise intensity increases, we get to the same levels of muscle glycogen depletion much faster as intensity comes up. And at 83%, we're getting a pretty depleted level in about 60 minutes. So once we move to ball sport, where we get these really high intensities for brief periods of time, we end up at the same depletion rates in less than 10 minutes of activity. So we think about American football, and American football is this three-hour game. But if we look at the sport in itself and we look at the activities of the athlete, a play is about five and a half seconds. Let's say they're going to run about 60 plays, 70 plays a game. We ended up at about 360 seconds of activity, maybe 420 seconds of activity. So we're looking at six to seven minutes of hard physical activity during this sport. But their intensities during this are actually at a much higher level than what we see a marathoner depleting their muscle glycogen stores in the 60, at the 65% of physical activity. And when we look at sports such as American football or ice hockey, we can see that muscle glycogen is being depleted by the sport in itself. In the study by Green on the right hand side, we're looking at ice hockey and the activities related to ice hockey being continuous or discontinuous. In the continuous when they're maintaining a higher or maintaining a more constant intensity for a prolonged period of time, and so we see this depletion in muscle glycogen levels. And in the right hand side of the graph on the right, we see them doing bursts of activity and then doing periods of some type of recovery or a lower intensity exercise. And because of these high bursts of activity, they're going to be more reliant on the glycogen that's stored inside the muscle and they're going to be depleting the glycogen inside the muscle faster. When we have the intensities that are more continuous in nature being prolonged type exercise, we're going to use the muscle glycogen but we're also going to be bringing muscle or bringing glucose in from the blood to be used as a fuel source. Because of the intermittent nature of the low intensity, high intensity, low intensity, high intensity, the glucose that's in the cell as muscle glycogen is the more convenient fuel and will be broken down quicker. So I, I got into the field of studying carbohydrate as my dissertation and my first job. And in this role, I was looking at the impact of lowering carbohydrate on performance. I had an idea that the levels that are present in sports drinks was too much carbohydrate. So I thought we'd be able to lower it and get sustained performance or better performance. And we did the similar endurance type exercise. We did two hours of cycling at 75% of VO2 max. And then we had a 20 kilometer time trial that do this possible. In this time trial, we found that carbohydrate improved performance. Whether we had 15 grams an hour, 30 grams an hour, or 60 grams an hour of glucose being ingested during that two hours, it improved performance compared to placebo. Once we got into these carbohydrate levels, statistically, they weren't different from one another. But what we saw is that they always trended towards the 60 grams per hour of carbohydrate being more important or being more valuable to an athlete than the lower levels. And this is one of the things that it's hard to look at in any of the sports supplements and sports nutrition is that when you're working with well-trained athletes, relying on statistical significance becomes hard because the athletes aren't statistically significantly different from one another. You do any gain that you can. And in this, we did see means with the 60 grams per hour faster than what we saw with 15 and 30. And the number of athletes performing better compared to placebo being greater at 60 grams per hour. Another part of this study is we actually 
labeled our carbohydrate with carbon-13 so that we could trace where the carbohydrate was be, being com coming from, whether it was coming from muscle glycogen or what was being ingested. So in this testing, we were able to track what was coming from fat and what was coming from carbohydrate. Our gray bars is the fuel that's being relied on from fat metabolism. When we had placebo, there was no carbohydrate in it, so we were unable to trace it. We weren't able to put the carbon-13 tracer in it. So what is in white is carbohydrate utilization, but I just can't tell the source, whether it's muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, or glucose coming from the exogenous sources. If we look at the three bars on the right at 15, 30, and 60 grams per hour, the difference in muscle glycogen utilization was, muscle glycogen was utilized the same no matter how much carbohydrate testing. So taking carbohydrate in didn't help muscle glycogen. If we look at total carbohydrate utilization, taking carbohydrate in didn't change total carbohydrate utilization. If we get down to plasma glucose though, we start seeing some differences. Plasma levels at all three ingestion rates were the same, but where the glucose was coming from within the plasma was quite different. As exogenous carbohydrate ingestion went up, there was a reduction in the reliance on glucose being utilized from the liver. So this was an interesting finding is that carbohydrate ingestion wasn't sparing our muscle glycogen, but it was sparing liver glycogen. So the amount of glucose stored in the liver is not inconsequential, but it's much smaller than muscle glycogen. But I think with muscle glycogen being in so readily available to be utilized as a fuel source within the muscle, if it's there, we're going to use that. And then we're going to try to bring fuels in and carbohydrate in to replenish that and then use as a fuel as opposed to sparing the muscle glycogen and using these glucose and these plasma glucose levels first. Now, another two graphs on that presentation that I, pay, I, I saw when we did the study, but I kind of lost interest in and didn't further explore were these two looking at the glucose and free fatty acid utilization. When we took in 30 and 60 grams of carbohydrate, blood glucose levels were the same throughout exercise. If um, we took in 15 grams an hour of carbohydrate, glucose remained basically at rest or the pre-exercise levels for the duration of the two hours. And when we took the placebo in, we saw a decline in blood glucose levels throughout exercise. I thought, okay, this shows exactly what we kind of expect. I was surprised that 30 grams per hour maintained blood glucose levels nearly as well as 60 grams per hour did, but okay, I'm, I'm good with this. Once I moved over to the free fatty acid slide though, we see that at 60 grams per hour, the free fatty acids circulating in the blood and being utilized were much lower than the other three treatments. After that, 30 grams per hour relied less on free fatty acids than the, and the placebo. In placebo, whether you had placebo or 15 grams per hour, free fatty acids were still a big fuel source. I noticed this and I don't think I appreciated it for probably about five years, but at 30 grams per hour, I was able to maintain the same blood glucose, but it seems I was able to increase the free fatty acid circulation and utilization as a fuel source. And as we get a little bit further, I, I'm, I wanna show you guys where this comes back into play. Now, again, what I've just showed you kind of sticks with that old mantra that carbohydrate is important for endurance exercise. We're not really getting at the sports that are being seen in a lot of our resistance trained athletes, our ball sport athletes, the stop and go athletes, but those studies have been done too. Again, Dr. Hoff has done some of these studies looking at what's the impact of carbohydrate ingestion on the number of repetitions to failure. So in this study, they had 55% of their one rep max and they were having to do 10 reps. And that was one set. They took three minutes between sets and they kept going until they couldn't complete 10 reps of the 55% of their one RM. And we see that when they ingested carbohydrate during the exercise, they were able to sustain, do more sets and do more reps of the exercise. When we look at 
a study that one of my doctoral students did kind of building off of my endurance athletes. He, we looked at resistance training in res, carbohydrate dose within resistance training. And we saw that compared to a control, the 60 grams per hour was nearly identical in performance. If there were any differences while these were insignificant, the 15 and the 30 are both approach significance compared to the placebo and being like 0.06 and 0.1 of having a benefit in the total number of repetitions being able to be performed. One of the things that we think in this study is that we look at endurance sport and the 60 grams per hour seems like it may be an acceptable dose to take in, but due to the increased intensity during resistance performance during those sets, taking in this much carbohydrate may lead to more GI discomfort and actually be harmful to performance. So it seems the lower doses may actually provide a benefit that the high doses kind of start working against. Now, all of this was kind of the bread and butter of my research focus for quite a number of years. Um, due to a lot of the stuff going on in like 2015, 2016, with a large discussion about ketogenic diets, we kind of took a turn with me deciding that, hey, I think low carbohydrate is a terrible idea. I think that I want, I'm going to do this diet and I want to show that it's going to have detrimental impacts on performance and all this so that as I do research on carbohydrate going forward, that I can speak to this knowledgeably. So I started the ketogenic diet. Um, it's one of several low carbohydrate diets. The definition of low carbohydrate, especially in science, gets quite mixed up. If we look at Low carbohydrate is normally considered anything below three to five grams of carbohydrate per kilogram. That's three to five grams per kilogram of body weight is considered the amount of carbohydrate that would be in a normal diet with those people, with people that are inactive. If we look at people doing some physical activity, the recommendation normally moves up to five to eight grams per kilogram of body weight. And then those doing really severe endurance type exercise may go eight to even 12 grams per kilogram of carbohydrate per body weight. Those taking in less than three are usually considered low carbohydrate. If we look at the ketogenic diet, the ketogenic diet is a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And this is the route that I went and I initially did it, like I said, to say, hey, I'm going to show that this is a bad idea. One of the things that I learned during my my plan to show it was a bad idea was that it wasn't actually as bad idea as I thought. Um, one of my hobbies is cycling. And one of the things that I took away from my time on the ketogenic diet is I quit getting fatigued during my long training sessions. I did notice that one of the, one of the things I really like in cycling is doing sprints and bursts of speed and bursts of power up a hill that seemed to have been detrimented to a, a certain extent. But if I'm in a, three to four hour bike ride, my feelings at the end of the day were not nearly as fatigued as they had been in the past. And my power was the same or maybe a little bit higher at that time point. And to this point, everybody had kind of been in the same ballpark and the same mindset that I was is that low carbohydrate is detrimental to athletes. And around this time, Luis Burke, uh, performance sports nutritionists out of Australia put out a study that said re-examining high fat diets for sports performance. Did we put a, the nail in the coffin too soon? You're also hearing at this time point that, hey, people that are doing ultras are benefiting because they're using the low, low fat or low carbohydrate diet and going to a high fat diet. So this was big interest at this time. linear relationship between muscle glycogen and fatigue. But when we look at this 60 minute exercise session, 
we see that carbohydrate perform better than placebo. All right, is, is we're thinking about the pathways, is we're thinking about the role of muscle glycogen. I don't really see where carbohydrate can improve performance against placebo in this short of a duration of exercise. So the authors of this study did a follow-up study where they had the same question. They're like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Let's infuse the carbohydrate directly into the blood. So as we're ingesting carbohydrate, the goal is to bring it into the mouth, get it into the stomach, get it into the blood and get it to the exercising muscle. So if we can bypass the mouth and the stomach and the intestine and get it straight into the blood, we should see the same thing. But when they did that, they did not see the same thing. Once they actually were inje inject or infusing the glucose into the blood, there were no differences between carbohydrate and placebo. So this got them thinking, and I think this is one of the first studies that went to the role Dr. Hirsch was talking about a little bit ago, is that their follow-up study was looking at a carbohydrate mouth rinse in a 40 kilometer time trial. So once they did the 40 kilometer time trial, they'd take in about five grams of carbohydrate, swish it around in their mouth for about 15 seconds and then spit it back out into a cup. And to make sure they were getting all the carbohydrate, carbohydrate out, they weighed the volume of the cup and measured that volume both pre and mouth rinse and post to make sure that none of it was actually being ingested. And what they saw was that carbohydrate improved performance even though none of it was actually being ingested. So this got a lot of people questioning, how is, how is this working? It started an entire line of research. And I think the, the study that gave us the direction of where we think now the role of this is going is they actually ingested a placebo and they ingested the carbohydrate mouth rinse. They mouth rinse with both and they found that different areas of the brain were being stimulated. So Dr. Hirsch already walked through this earlier is that the idea that we have right now is that once carbohydrate is in the mouth, we're stimulating these receptors that more carbohydrates on the way. And with that carbohydrate on the way, we may be able to utilize more of our muscle glycogen stores. So this only works in these activities that are gonna be under 60 minutes, under 90 minutes, where we're not truly depleting muscle glycogen. Once muscle glycogen is gone, we lose this high energy production is going to produce ATP quick enough for us to have sustained stronger performance. But until that time point, we can kind of trick the body into thinking that there's more fuel on the way. Let's go ahead and expand what we have and push exercise intensity higher. So with this idea in mind, we pursued a line of research looking at high intensity interval cycling where we did carbohydrate ingestion, carbohydrate mouth rinse, placebo ingestion, and the placebo mouth rinse. And what we found was that there wasn't much difference. We um, had a small treatment effect, but we couldn't differentiate between the different treatments in this model. And when we look at ingestion, carbohydrate ingestion resulted in a greater total workload as compared to the other three treatments. So if, again, if we're looking at athletes, why not statistically different, it seems that if, again, with these high intensity training, we may be depleting muscle glycogen levels at a faster rate than in some of the other exercises we think of. And carbohydrate ingestion and bringing the fuel in may be more beneficial as a way to provide energy as opposed to mouth rinsing and trying to trick the body. Because at these high intensities, we're actually looking at muscle glycogen levels being depleted at a rate that supplementation can be beneficial. So when we look now at the recommendations for carbohydrate ingestion, most of the recommendations state if you're under 60 minutes, mouth rinse will work. Um, there's not really a need to go over about 30 grams per hour. Once we get up to about 90 minutes, again, we want somewhere 30 grams to mouth rinse, it, probably moving more towards the 30 grams. As we're getting up to two hours, we may move closer to the 60 grams of carbohydrate being ingested each hour. And then once we're going over two hours, we want to make sure that we're bringing in carbohydrate in both those fast forms and the slow forms we talked about earlier in the presentation so that we can use these fuels faster and maybe push our way up to 90 grams of ingestion or 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour 
or 1.4, 1.5 grams per minute of carbohydrate oxidation. When we think of the 1.5 grams of oxidation, that's how much is being used from an outside source. If we look at the total amount of carbohydrate being used in those times, there are some studies that you'll see people getting three to four grams of carbohydrate being utilized a minute to maintain intensity. So even taking carbohydrate in, we're not using all of the carbohydrate from what's being ingested. Part of it is having on body stores. So one of the fears people have is if I ingest carbohydrate during exercise, it's gonna go in and be stored as fat and however that pathway they see works. But instead, everything that you take in can be used, but you're still gonna be taking away from your body stores. If we can improve our chances of having better performance tomorrow by improving muscle glycogen stores, we're gonna set ourselves up for better performance in the future or better training in the future. So with that, I will open it up for some questions from you guys. Great, thanks so much, that was great. We do have some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, let's start with Jessica. How much carbohydrate should weightlifters consume? I guess part of that is the question of how are they training? Like what's the intensity? What's the duration they're training? Um, and then what's their goal? Mm -hmm. I, I think if we look at a normal gym goer, I think that three to five range is going to fit them fine. If we look at somebody that is training seriously, um, we're looking at multiple hours every day, I think five to eight. I think there are a few, but very few resistance training athletes that may be in that upper end of the eight to 10. I wouldn't push them all the way to 12, but those guys are kind of those real extremes. They're doing heavy, heavy training every day. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's see here. Uh, hi, Dr. Smith. Great presentation in Hale State. I know that you used 15, 30, and 60 grams per hour in previous research, but is there a way to quantify if gram or quantify it in grams per kg? And similarly, do you think that quantifying it with kg of skeletal muscle mass instead of body weight would be any different? So that's a good question. Um, I like looking at these as grams per hour instead of grams per kg, because when I look at the delivery methods, I think of what people are gonna get and it's gonna be commercially available. So it is unfortunately gonna be a one size fits all. Um, that said, when they've looked at the oxidation rates, body size hasn't seemed to play a role in it. So if we're inject a person that's 70 kilos ingesting 60 grams an hour or a person that's 100 kilos or 120 kilos ingesting 60 grams an hour, 90 grams an hour plus, their oxidation rates seem to be very similar and body size isn't having a big role in it. I think once you get to the muscular level, if we can get past the gut, then I think the grams per kg is a better way to look at it from a scientific questions, but I think we lose some of our real world practicality of that information. Mm -hmm. Great. Are isomalchulose and trehalulose theoretical considerations or are there common foods that actually contain them? There are foods that contain these. Um, some of these are the prolonged slow release carbohydrates. These are some of the ones that fall into products that are considered slow release or long duration carbohydrates. And I think my issue with them is the fact that you're bringing this carbohydrate into the body, it's getting into the intestinal system or getting into the stomach. And the reason it's slow release is because it's stuck there is we're trying to break this bond mm -hmm. between the glucose and the fructose or the two glucose units. And as we continue to consume foods and carbohydrates, that concentration builds up in the stomach and the osmolality is gonna increase and start pulling fluid in. I think it's going to predispose you to some GI upset mm -hmm. because you're not moving that out of the intestine, getting into the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, to correct me if I'm wrong, I think honey has isomalchulose in it. I think so, to, to some yeah. extent, yeah. 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 Uh, Jen Kurtz here. 
Uh, what about above 60 grams per hour during exercise? Is there a threshold of carbohydrate intake during exercise? So most, part of it's gonna depend on the carbohydrate. If we're glucose only, I wouldn't go over 60 grams an hour because that seems to be the maximal rate of what can be ingested to what can get through the stomach. Um, if we're using mixed carbohydrates, we're using glucose fructose or glucose sucrose because sucrose has that fructose unit on it. I think we can take that up to about 90 grams per hour of what can be ingested without animal effects as far as GI upset. Mm -hmm. That's an endurance sport. Once we move to resistance sport or high intensity interval type sport, um, football, basketball, resistance training, I, I think those numbers are going to shift down some. I think the intensity is going to change blood flow to the gut. I think we need to study this further, but I think that mm -hmm. we're going to see a reduced ability to get to these high of levels that we see in endurance sport. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Amanda Finn has a really, really, really great question here. Could chronic use of the carbohydrate mouth rinse lead to habituation in the brain centers that were activated? Uh, I think you're going to have to have to make some hypotheses here in terms of what what might happen. I, I think that's a fun question. Um, uh -huh. It, it, and I'm trying to think through the process. I, I think if I look at a training session or I look at a performance session, um, I would probably do the mouth rinse in training, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, I'm doing, if I'm in performance and I'm competing, I don't want to take a maybe. If I'm training, though, I may do it in training, but if I'm feeding myself afterwards, glucose protein afterwards, I don't know there's ever a point that you're going to see the mouth rinse become trained mm -hmm. to recognize it. Um, I think if you try to do the mouth rinse and then you're not doing recovery nutrition, I think you may do it. I, I think that's a really fun question. That's yeah. fun to explore. Yeah, Amanda, if you're, a, if you're a student or a researcher, you should explore that area. That's great. Uh, Melissa Hare, how long does it take for high GI carbs to replenish stored glycogen? So glycogen I, replenishment question. Again, I'm sorry, I missed part of that. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, how long does it take for high GI carbs to replenish stored glycogen? So, so carbohydrate replenishment. So that's a question going to be how depleted did the muscle glycogen get? Mm -hmm. um, some of the studies suggest it takes more than 48 hours to replenish muscle glycogen stores if they're severely, if severely depleted. Remember that we may be utilizing, I, I had one um, athlete I tested one time, I had him burning six grams per minute and he, he was a football player. So that's at the high intensity portion. That's not at throughout the entire duration. But if we're getting those types of depletion, there's no way ingestion can match that if we can only get up to about one and a half grams a minute. I think one of the things that really blew my mind with some of the tracer work is that we're ingesting these carbohydrates and you're thinking, I get it into my, I, I ingest it and I'm going to see it 30 minutes, 45 minutes later. And we were actually getting carbon 13 starting to show up in the breath within the 15 minute window. So actually getting it through the digestive system and into the blood is a really quick process but muscle glycogen is being depleted faster than you can replenish it with oral ingestion. Mm -hmm. Depending on the depletion of that exercise session is going to be really dependent on how long it takes.